G'day, this is Chris Savage from RL Ministries in Australia. Welcome you to this session of the Footsteps of the Messiah. This is a study of the last days, and I pray that it will be a benefit to you and help you in your Christian growth. Thank you for coming. So we're uh, we're looking into the uh, the Great Tribulation section uh, tonight, but just quickly, uh, last session, we, we finished off looking at the events in heaven prior to the Tribulation and uh, one of the things was the Messiah's throne and the throne of God. And we see also uh, there was uh, the Holy Spirit's in heaven, third member of the Trinity, uh, because in uh, looking at Revelation chapter four, verse five, it says, out of the throne proceed lightnings and voices and thunders. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. So these seven spirits of God are representative of seven attributes of the Holy Spirit which we see in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2. Revelation 4, verses 6 to 8, they describe four living creatures. Now, before the throne, as it were, a sea of glass, uh, like on two crystal. In the midst of the throne and round about the throne, four living creatures full of eyes before and behind. First creature was like a lion, and the second creature like a calf, and the third creature had a face as of a man. And the fourth creature was like a flying eagle four living creatures having each of them each one of them six wings are full of eyes round about and within they have no rest day and night saying holy 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 is the lord god the almighty who was and who is and who is to come now the fact that these uh, creatures are described as having six wings and crying holy 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 would make them the same as the seraphim that we see in Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 to 3. Um, Isaiah says there, he saw the Lord sitting upon a throne and uh, his train for the temple, but round about him or above him stood the seraphim, each with six wings. Same thing we're seeing here in Revelation. With two, he covered his face, two, he covered his feet, and with two, he flew. So, and again, the same thing back then, these seraphim were crying, holy, holy, holy is Jehovah of hosts. So Revelation now closes in this section here. Revelation 4 closes in verses 9 to 11, describing the continuous worship before the throne. When the living creatures shall give glory and honor and thanks to him that sits on the throne, to him that lives forever and ever. The four and twenty elders shall fall down before him that sits on the throne and shall worship him that lives forever and ever and shall cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive the glory and the honor and the power. For you did create all things, and because of your will they were and were created. So, following the cry, crying of the triad, holy, 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 the 24 elders cast their crowns before the throne. Now, this is not, uh, not uh, supposedly, it doesn't have to be a once for all action, whereby the saints who have received their crowns give them a permanently messiah it's uh because the, the 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 crying of the seraphim is a continuous thing holy 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 they're continually doing that so is the casting of the crown so it's not a question here of the church saints giving up the crowns forever but it is a continuous removal of the crowns from the heads of the elders in worship of god the father and the cry of their chorus is viewed as being continuous, continuously praising God the Father. Okay, so we're into a new section now, which is the Lamb and the Seven Seal Scroll, which is in chapter 5, verses 1 to 14, Revelation. Again, we're, we're in events in heaven at this time before the tribulation. So this uh, chapter 5 describes the Lamb and the Seven Sealed Scroll. It's, this is a prelude to the seven seal judgments. Now, uh, remember that all three sets of judgments, seals, trumpets, bowls, are going to be preceded by a bit of a prelude in heaven. And the prelude to the seal judgments, prelude is just a bit of a, a breather, if you like, uh, is found in chapter 5 of Revelation. So we now see the seven seal scroll is, is, is brought up in verse one. He said, I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne, a book written within and on the back, closed, sealed with seven seals. So this is, this is 
not what we know as a book. This is actually a scroll. Um, that's what it means in Greek anyway. And so this scroll is written on both sides, inside and outside. And it's now sealed with seven seals. And then verses two to four, Revelation five, describe they've got a problem of the scroll. An angel proclaimed, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no one in, in the heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the book or to look thereon. So the problem we have here is the seven seal, the problem we have here of the seven seal scroll was that no one was found worthy to open it. So John, you remember this angel is talking to John here. Now we see in verses five to seven, the problem is now solved. And uh, because one of the elders says to, 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 to John, weep not, the lion that is of the tribe of Judah has overcome to open the book and the seven seals thereof. So, and John says, he says, he says, I saw in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders, a lamb standing as though it had been slain having seven horns, seven eyes, to the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. So what we see here is that the second person of the Trinity is the one who is now worthy to open the seven seal scroll. He's referred to as the Lion of Judah, but when John looks at him, he sees the Lion of Judah as a lamb standing. So what we're looking at here is the two comings of the Messiah. The first time he came, he came as a lamb. Remember, he was a lamb of God. Remember John the Baptist says, from the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So this lamb in the first coming died for the sins of the world. Now, in his second coming, he's not coming as a lamb. That's, uh, that's in history. But he's now coming as a lion ready to strike, ready to pounce. Where it says there, as though it has been slain, this is actually an idiom for a resurrected individual. Jesus was killed, and by all human experience, he should have been remained in the ground dead. But he was very much alive because he was resurrected. Now, why was he worthy to open the scroll? Couldn't God the Father or the Holy Spirit do this? Because both of them were in heaven at the same time. So in this context that we're looking at here, to become worthy to open the seven seal scroll required one to die for sins and then be resurrected. This is a context of what we're reading here. So only the son was worthy in this respect. Now, we see having seven horns. Well, that just means he has, remember, remember the number seven, it's completeness, fullness. It means he has full authority and omnipotence. Having seven eyes means he's om, he's, he talks about his omnipresence and his omniscience. He is everywhere and he knows all things. Now, since the lion lamb is, is the one found worthy to break the seals, chapter five now concludes with a description of the worship of the lamb in verses eight to 14. We see the prayers of the saints in verses eight to 10. We see the golden bowls full of incense which it says are the prayers of the saints. And the saints here are singing a new song. Worthy are you to take the book and to open the seals thereof. And here they tell us why. Because you were slain and did purchase unto God with your blood, men of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And then we have the additions of the angels now in verses 11 to 12, a voice of many angels round about the throne and the living creatures and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. A lot of them. And they were all saying, worthy is the lamb that has been slain to receive the power, riches, wisdom, etc., might and honor. And then we see the addition of all creation in verse 13, because it says, and every created thing saying unto him, unto him that sits on the throne and unto the lamb. So they're worshiping the lamb, the lamb of God. Now, Verse 14, we see they conclude here, and the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders then fell down and worshipped. They're worshipping the lamb who was slain, who is the lion of Judah. Now we're coming into now the, the third section that we're looking at, which is the great tribulation. 
Uh, um, we, we're looking at the last days here. So uh, we're going to look here at the seven year period commonly called the Great Tribulation. Um, some call this period the, the just a tribulation and use the term Great Tribulation only for the second half of the seven year period, second three and a half years. But in actual fact, uh, the term Great Tribulation is used of the entire seven year period and not just the later half. Some names that we find in, in the Old Testament, the most common name for the Great Tribulation in the Hebrew Scriptures is the Day of Jehovah or the Day of the Lord. Uh, that's the most common name. It's also found in several passages in the New Testament as well. Now, sometimes that day is used negatively and positively. And so many times it applies. So many times it actually applies to the millennium. But the day of Jehovah or the day of the Lord are always used negatively and never include the millennial kingdom. Because the day of Jehovah, the day of the Lord is a time of great tribulation. We see uh, a couple of the names that they use here. The, it's the time of Jacob's trouble in Jeremiah 30, verse 7, 70th week of Daniel uh, 9, 27, Jehovah's strange work in Isaiah 28, 21, Jehovah's strange act in the same chapter, uh, day, of day of Israel's calamity in Deuteronomy 32, 35, and Obadiah, verses 12 to 14, the tribulation in uh, Deuteronomy 4, 30, Indignation in Isaiah 26, 20 and Daniel 11, 36. Overflowing scourge, Isaiah 28, 15 and 18. Not finished yet. Day of vengeance, Isaiah 34, 8, 35, 4 and 61, 2. Year of recompense, again in Isaiah 34, 8. The time of trouble, Daniel 12, 1 or, and Zephaniah 1, 15. The day of wrath. Zephaniah 1, 15, day of distress, same chapter, day of desolation, same chapter, day of darkness, again, Zephaniah 1, 15, Amos 5, 18 and 20, and Joel 2, verse 2. The day of gloominess, again, we sit in Zephaniah 1, 15 and Joel 2, 2. And the last four in the Old Testament, the day of clouds, Zephaniah 1, 15, again, Joel 2, 2. Day of thick darkness, Zephaniah and Joel again. Day of the trumpet. Zephaniah 1, 16, not 15. And the day of alarm is Zephaniah 1, 16. In the New Testament, we see 1 Thessalonians 5, 2. It calls it the day of the Lord. And then we have the wrath of God in Revelation 15, 1 and 7. Revelation 14, 10, 19 and 16, 1. The hour of trial in Revelation 3, 10. The great day of the wrath of the Lamb of God, Revelation 6, 16 to 17. The wrath to come. 1 Thessalonians 1.10, the wrath, uh, which is the wrath, which is 1 Thessalonians 5.9 and Revelation 11.18. Great Tribulation 24.21, Revelation 2, 2, verse 22 and 7.14. Tribulation, Matthew 24.29, Hour of Judgment, Revelation 14.7. Oh, we got through them. Now, what are the, what's the purposes of the Great Tribulation? Well, we have three main purposes for the Great Tribulation. First up, it's to end wickedness and to destroy the wicked ones. That's the first reason, first purpose. Second purpose is to bring about a worldwide revival. And then the third purpose is to break the power or the stubborn will of the Jewish nation. Remember, uh, back in, in, in Exodus, uh, often called a stiff-necked people. Now, we're looking at uh, first, first purpose is to make an end of wickedness and the wicked ones. And two key passages we find with this. Uh, first is Isaiah 13, 9. And then we're also going to look at Isaiah 24, 90 to 20. Um, so in Isaiah 13, 9, it says, Behold, the day of Jehovah comes, cruel with wrath and fierce, and fierce anger, to make the land a desolation and to destroy the sinners thereof out of it. So there, there is the first purpose, to destroy the sinners out of the land. And the term day of Jehovah is used here as a reference to the great tribulation. And the goal here is to destroy the sinners out of it. So first purpose of the tribulation is to destroy the wicked ones within the land. This is the land of, of uh, 
um, um, Israel. Now, Isaiah goes on to describe this goal um, in Isaiah 24, 19 to 20, where it says the earth is utterly broken, the earth is rent asunder, the earth is shaken violently, the earth shall stagger like a drunken man and shall sway to and fro like a hammock, and the transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it, and it shall fall and not rise again. So here we see here that the basic goal for the judgments of the tribulation is that the worldwide rebellion, this is now worldwide, shall fall and not rise again. So purposes, first purpose is to make an end of wickedness and wicked ones. Second uh, purpose is to bring about a worldwide revival. And this we find in Revelation chapter 7, verses 1 to 17. 1 to 8 describes the means by which God will bring about this worldwide revival. 9 to 17 gives the results of this, this great worldwide revival. Verses 1 to 8, John gives the means how this is going to be accomplished. Now, in verses 1 to 3, the four angels are commi commissioned to hurt not the earth until they have sealed the servants of God. And the number of those servants was 144,000. So here John introduces in verses five, 5 to 8, the ministry of the 144,000 Jewish evangelists. That is 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes who will be sharing the gospel in all of the world. Yes, by means of these Jewish evangelists that God will bring about the worldwide revival and accomplish another goal of the tribulation. Now, this revival is going to occur in the first three and a half years of the tribulation, which we're going to look at uh, later on. Not tonight, but much later on. But there's a great advantage in using Jews to conduct a worldwide revival because the for, for a start, the Jews are scattered all over the world. All major and minor languages, or, or, or and a great number of the world's minor languages, are spoken by some Jews somewhere. In fact, most Jews are, are actually bilingual. And most Jews receive a, a good and basic understanding of the Old Testament text. So they have a greater or lesser uh, knowledge, degree of knowledge of the Hebrew scriptures, depending on their background. So at some time after the rapture of the church, the Lord will save 144,000 Jews from around the world. Now, these Jews will already speak the languages needed. They already have a basic knowledge of the Hebrew scriptures. All they'll need to learn is the content of the New Testament. So they, these guys could, be, they could begin to preach the gospel shortly after coming to faith in Jesus. I mean, Paul the Apostle did. So the evangelization of the world by means of 144,000 Jews during the first half of the tribulation will fulfill the prophecy, which we find in Matthew 24, verse 14, which says, this gospel of the kingdom should be preached in the whole world for a testimony unto all the nations, and then shall the end come. Now, Following the vision of the 144,000 Jews in the first part of, of Revelation chapter 7, John then describes seeing the results of the ministry of these guys in verses 9 to 17. Uh, and it, it speaks of a, a great multitude, which no man could number out of every nation and of all tribes and peoples and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb, arrayed in white robes and palms in their hands. Now. So what they'll see is there'll be a countless number of Gentiles, as well as other Jews, will come to a saving knowledge of the Savior during the tribulation period. So by means of the 144,000 Jew Jewish evangelists, God will accomplish the second purpose of the Great Tribulation, which is that of bringing about a worldwide revival. Then verses 11 to 12 is the worship of the one on the throne. And all the angels were standing round about the throne and round about the, and about the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell down before the throne on their faces and worshipped God. So in verses 13 to 14, we have the identification of the multitude. These are they that come out of the great tribulation and they washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And then in verse 15 to 17, we see the comfort enjoyed after martyrdom in heaven. 
For the lamb that is in the midst of the throne shall be their shepherd, and God shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. Now, the third purpose is to break the power or the stubborn will of the Jewish people, Jewish nation. Now, in Daniel chapters 11 to 12, the prophet was given a vision of what conditions would be like for his people and his people of Israel during the tribulation. Then in Daniel chapter 12, verses 5 to 7, a question is raised as to how long this period would be allowed to continue. How long should it be to the end of these wonders? This is the tribulation period. I heard the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river when he held up his right hand and his left hand onto heaven and swore by him that lives forever that it should be for a time, times and a half. And when they've made an end of breaking in pieces the power of the holy people, <coughs> all these things shall be finished. So it's for a period of three and a half years. And God intends to break the power or, or, or the stubborn will of the, of the holy people in order to bring about a national regeneration. Now, the means by which is, this is going to happen, we find in Ezekiel chapter 20, verses 33 to 38. And this is a, a summary of that chapter. As I live, says the Lord Jehovah, surely with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and with wrath poured out, will I be king over you, talking about the Jews. Now I'll bring you out from the peoples and will gather you out of the countries wherein you are scattered and with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and with wrath poured out. And I'll bring you into the wilderness of the peoples and there will I enter into judgment with you face to face. So what we're seeing here is that after God gathers the Jews from around the world, he'll enter into a period of judgment, which is the tribulation period, with them. The rebels among the Jewish people will be purged out by this judgment. Only then will the whole new nation, what's left, a regenerate nation, be allowed to enter the promised land under King Messiah. Now, there are some general descriptions in the, in the, uh, in the Hebrew scriptures. Uh, many, many passages in the Old Testament describe the nature and times of the Great Tribulation. We're just going to look at a couple of them. Uh, Isaiah 24, 1 to 13 is a key one. This is called the little apocalypse of Isaiah. Now, it's called the little, little apocalypse because it has very strong similarities to the book of Revelation, the ap apocalyptic book. Now, verses 24, 1 to 3 depict the earth in utter desolation because of the judgments of the tribulation. Jehovah makes the earth empty and makes it waste and turns it upside down and scatters abroad the inhabitants thereof. The earth shall be utterly emptied and utterly laid waste, for Jehovah has spoken this word. In Isaiah 24, 19 to 20, the earth is pictured as staggering from the judgments of the tribulation, which have fallen upon it because of sin. And these judgments are a necessary corollary to God's righteousness. And this is recognized by the righteous ones living at that time according to Isaiah 26, 8 to 10. Yes, in the way of your judgments, O Jehovah, have we waited for you. So these are the righteous ones living in that time. To your name, even to your memorial name, is the desire of your soul. So these are believers. These are part of the remnant, the believers in, in, in Messiah at that time. Isaiah 26, 20 to 21 states the righteous ones are especially protected or specially protected by God as the judgments are poured out against all unrighteousness. Come, my people, enter into your chambers and shut your doors about you. Hide yourself for a little moment until the indignation be overpassed. There's that indignation, that's, a, that's an Old Testament term for the Great Tribulation. For behold, Jehovah comes forth out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. So the righteous ones are protected, uh, according to Isaiah uh, 26, 20 to 21, during this period. Now we have some day of Jehovah passages here. Um, now, the day of Jehovah or, or the tribulation period begins with the signing of the seven-year covenant and ends with the second coming of Messiah exactly seven years later. 
Now, some teach that the day of Jehovah, the tribulation starts with the rapture. But the thing is, <laughs> there could easily be a time, a, a great deal of time between the rapture and the start of the tribulation. Remember, the rapture is imminent. It can happen any time. So it's better to view the day of Jehovah starting with the seven-year covenant because Daniel tells us that as well. Now, we have other times we have expressions such as that day or in that day, which are used for both the tribulation and the millennium. However, the term day of Jehovah is never used for anything outside of the great tribulation, day of Jehovah. Isaiah 2, 12 to 22 uh, emphasizes the terror of Jehovah that will be manifested at that time. For there shall be a day of Jehovah of hosts upon all that is proud and haughty and upon all that is lifted up and it shall be brought low. In verse 17, and the loftiness of man shall be bowed down and the haughtiness of men shall be brought low and Jehovah alone shall be exalted in that day. Idols shall utterly pass away. Men shall go into the caves of the rocks and the holes of the earth from before the terror of Jehovah and from the glory of his majesty when he arises to shake mightily the earth. So men in this period will be trying to hide in this terrible day. They're going to try and hide in the, in the caves and under the rocks. Then Isaiah 13, 6 to 16 goes on. It elaborates for the, on the first purpose of the tribulation, which was to make an end of wickedness and wicked ones. It talks about the day of Jehovah coming with, with cruel, with wrath and fierce anger to make the land of desolation and to destroy the sinners thereof out of it. Goes on to say, I'll punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity and I'll cause the arrogance of the proud to cease and I'll lay them all low. I'll make the heavens to tremble and the earth to be shaken out of its place in the wrath of Jehovah of hosts and in the day of his fierce anger. Again, another term for the Great Tribulation. Ezekiel 30, verses 1 to 9, describes the, <coughs> excuse me, the effects of the day of Jehovah on the Middle East nations, especially on Egypt. The day is near, even the day of Jehovah is near. It should be a day of clouds, a time of the nations. And a sword shall come upon Egypt, and anguish shall be in Ethiopia when the slain shall fall in Egypt. So Ethiopia and Put and Lud and all the mingled people and Cub and the children of the land that is in league shall fall with them by the sword. So this is a time when specifically bad for uh, the Middle East nations. Uh, it's going to set a fire in Egypt and all her helpers, which, which were the ones we just spoke about there, are destroyed. Now in Joel 1, 15 to 20, Joel stresses how the day of Jehovah will affect the crops of the earth. Um, it says, that, is not the food cut off before our eyes? Yes, joy and gladness from the house of our God. So this is Joel in his prophecy. Obadiah, verses 10 to 20, describes the effects of the, on the land of Edom, which is present-day southern Jordan. And he talks about, for the violence done to your brother Jacob, remember Esau was Jacob's brother, shame shall cover you and you shall be cut off forever. And the house of Jacob shall be a fire and the house of Joseph a flame and the house of Esau for stubble. So it's destruction of Edom. <coughs> and there should not be any remaining of the house of Esau for Jehovah has spoken it. So the day of Jehovah, it will be especially heavy in Edom because of their special mistreatment of Israel. Though other nations are equally guilty, Edom has a unique shame. Why? Because it's a blood relation to Israel. Then Zephaniah chapter 1 verses 14 to 18 portrays the day of Jehovah as a day of darkness and distress and also refers to the first purpose of the, tri first purpose of the tribulation. And it's, it's about <clears throat> a day of trouble and distress, a day of darkness and gloominess. I'll bring distress upon men. They shall walk like blind men because they have sinned against Jehovah. Now moving to the New Testament, 2 Peter 3, 10 to 12, describes the day of Jehovah as a time of burning for the earth. Though the Lord will come as a thief, which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall be dissolved with fervent heat and the earth and the works that are therein shall be burned up. So the, the, the way the earth is going to be burned up is by the fiery judgments contained in the seal, trumpet, and bowl judgments. 
And the scripture gives some special descriptions of the day of tribulation as a time of darkness, torment, anguish, turmoil, confusion, death, massive destruction, especially by fire. At the beginning of the tribulation, we find this is, uh, we're going to find this in Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 27. Again, we'll find here in Daniel that it is not the rapture that begins the tribulation, but it is a signing of a seven-year covenant between the Antichrist and Israel. And we have two key passages. We have the Daniel one here, Daniel 9, 24 to 27, and also Isaiah 28, verses 14 to 22. This is just a chat, uh, just again, to just to refresh your memory on the things which you might have done when we did uh, the book of Revelation. So we have the seal judgments and the trumpet judgments in the first half of the tribulation. In Daniel 9, 24 to 27, verses 1 to 23 actually gives the introduction to the 77's prophecy found in verses 24 to 27. We find the background in verses 1 to 2. You know, Daniel has been studying the writings of, of Jeremiah, uh, as well as some of the other prophets, uh, such as Isaiah. And he knew from, from Jeremiah uh, uh, that, that, uh, and other uh, prophets that the Babylonian captivity was only to last 70 years. You know, he realized the 70 years were nearly up. And, and what he misunderstood from these prophecies was regarding the setting up of the messianic or millennial kingdom. Well, he didn't know about the millennial kingdom. He knew about the messianic kingdom. He believed that it would be set up following the 70 years of captivity. You know, he also knew from these prophets that the prerequisite for the establishment of the kingdom would be Israel's national confession of her sins. Now, assuming that the Babylonian captivity would be immediately followed by the kingdom, Daniel prayed a prayer of confession for Israel's sins in verses 3 to 19. And in verses 20 to 23, the angel Gabriel was sent to correct Daniel's misunderstanding. He came to reveal God's program, which would bring in the kingdom. Now, in a play upon words, he informed Daniel that it was not going to be 70 years, but 77 of years before the kingdom would be established got the hiccups and we see the decree of the 77s in daniel chapter 9 verse the first part of 24 now gabriel said to daniel 70 weeks are decreed upon your people and upon your holy city now it's unfortunate here that the word hebrew word shavuim uh, s-h-a-v-u-i-m has been translated here as weeks if it were actually weeks, it would have been the word Shavuot. But uh, the word used here is Shavum, which does not mean weeks, but it means sevens. Now, the word seven can refer to anything. This can be sevens of anything, just like a dozen can mean a dozen of anything. What we see here is, remember the context that we're in. The context that we're in here is, is, uh, is, is Daniel is talking about the 70 years about the 70 years of captivity. Uh, so Shavuom here must refer to a seven of years because Daniel is, has been dealing with years. He's been counting the 70 years of the Babylonian captivity, expecting that after the 70 years was fulfilled, the kingdom was now going to be set up. So Daniel was clearly thinking, thinking in terms of years. Now in the Hebrew text, we have a play upon words here. Daniel is told that it is not 70 years, but that 77s of years must pass before the introduction of the kingdom. Now, here in this passage, Shavuom means 77s of years, and that's a total of 490 years. In other words, Gabriel told Daniel that a 490-year period has been decreed. Now, Hebrew word for decreed means to cut off or to determine. Now, up to this point in his book, Daniel has been dealing with the theme of the times of the Gentiles. So remember, this is a period of time that began with Nebuchadnezzar's destruction of Jerusalem in 586 BC. 
And it's going to end with the close of the tribulation, the second coming of the Messiah. Just remember, Daniel was the prophet who was given lengthy and detailed revelation concerning the nature of the times of the Gentiles. Remember, he was the one who it was revealed to him about the four Gentile empires, which we looked at back in earlier on, back in Daniel, Daniel 2 and Daniel 7. And this is this, these empires cover the history of the times of the Gentiles. So in the 77th passage, Daniel is told that a period of 490 years is decreed or being cut out of the times of the Gentiles to bring about the final restoration of Israel. 70 weeks are decreed upon your people and upon your city, your holy city. So here we see in, in this verse here, we see that the program is decreed upon your people now, your, remember, Daniel is a Jew, so Daniel's people, it's the Jewish people. And upon your holy city, Daniel's holy city is Jerusalem. So the center of the program of the 77s is specifically the Jewish people and the Jewish city of Jerusalem. It has nothing to do, nothing to do with God's plan for the church. The 77s program concerns Israel, and this will involve both comings of Messiah. First and second coming. 70 weeks. This is a Daniel 9, 24, the second part, 24b. 70 weeks are decreed upon your people and upon your holy city to finish transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. So the second part of verse 24 gives us the purpose of the 77s. They were decreed to finish transgression and to make an end of sins, make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. So this 490-year period that God has decreed upon the Jewish people will accomplish these six things. Now, the first three of them are negative. Uh, they're, they're undesirable bits. Uh, they're going to be removed during the program of the 70 years. Second three things are positive, they're desirable, uh, which are to be accomplished during the program of the 70 year, 77s. So we have the three positive uh, elements there. Uh, they respond to the three negative elements, uh, one to four, two to five, three to six, as you can see there on that um, PowerPoint. Um, so let's rather than get through it all, there it is for you. Now, to finish, to finish transgression. Daniel says it's to finish transgression. Now, the word translated as finish here means to restrain firmly or to restrain completely. It's to bring to completion. Transgression is a very strong term for sin. It literally means to rebel. And in the Hebrew text, it has a definite article. It's the transgression. It is, it is not just a transgression. It is the transgression to finish the rebellion. It's a specific rebellion. So it's one specific act of rebellion that is supposed to be brought to completion. And the context here shows that this specific transgression is the rejection of the Messiahship of Jesus. In Isaiah 53, verses 1 to 9, and Zechariah 12, 10 to 31, it speaks of a time when this sin, this transgression, is being brought to completion. In this first purpose, a specific sin is to come under control so that it will no longer flourish. And this sin is Israel's national rejection of the Messiahship of Jesus. This sin is now to be firmly restrained is it to be brought to completion, brought to an end. Same point we see in Isaiah 59, 20 and Romans 11, verse 26. Then it's to, the second purpose is to make an end of sins. The Hebrew word translated as to make an end means to seal up or to shut up in a prison house. It's to be securely kept up, to be locked up, to be prevented from roaming around at random. That, that's the word for uh, make an end. Now, Hebrew word for sins means to miss the mark. 
and these are sins in daily life. So sins then would be put to an end or taken away. Now, we know that there will be sins in the kingdom. But what this verse is saying is that while there may be sin among the Gentile nations, in the kingdom there will be no sin in Israel. This very same truth is taught by Isaiah 27 verse 9, Isaiah 27 9, uh, Ezekiel 36, 25 to 27, and 37, 23, and Romans 11, verse 27. You know, this is also the point of the new covenant in Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34, where Jeremiah clearly predicts that they will come when all Israel's sins will be removed and all Israel will be saved, from the least to the greatest. It will not be necessary in the kingdom for one Jew to say to another, know the Lord, for they will all know him from the least to the greatest. So the second purpose of the 77s is to bring an end to sins in general in daily living in the nation of Israel, in the people of Israel. So on one hand, the Lord will deal with the one specific transgression, which is a rejection of the Messiah of Jesus, whereas on the other hand, Daily sin, sinning in Israel will also cease. Only, only for, in Israel, only for the Jews, not for the Gentiles. The third purpose is to make reconciliation for iniquity. Reconciliation means to make an atonement. Uh, so Israel's national sin of rejecting the Messiah and her daily sins will now be removed by an atonement. Uh, and here the word iniquity uh, refers to the sin nature. So the third purpose of the 77s is to make an atonement specifically for the sin nature. So this is a cleansing of Israel that would include the removal of, removal of three things. The national sin of rejecting Jesus' messiahship, the daily sins, and the sin nature itself. So this is a cleansing of Israel. It's also to bring in everlasting righteousness. This is the fourth purpose. Or more literally, it means to bring in an age of righteousness, which is what the Hebrew word for everlasting really means. And this age of righteousness is called the messianic kingdom and also the millennium. So this is the same point that uh, uh, made by um, Isaiah in Isaiah 1, verse 26, uh, Isaiah 11, verses 2 to 5, and Isaiah 32, verse 17. Jeremiah also speaks with this, Jeremiah 23, verses 5 to 6, and Jeremiah 33, verses 15 to 18. Now, Daniel thought the kingdom would be set up immediately after the 70 years of captivity. Now he's being told that this will occur not after 70 years, but after 77s of years or 490 years. Now, another thing, another purpose of, of, of the 77s here is to seal up vision and prophecy. To seal up means to shut up or to cause a, a cessation. It's to bring completely to fulfillment. That's what seal up means. Now, vision actually refers to prophecies made orally, like those of Elijah and Elisha. Prophecy refers to prophecies found in written form, such as in the books of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and, and the, the, the minors, the 12 minor prophets. And the fifth purpose of the 77s is to cause cessation of both oral and written prophecy, because this will contain the final fulfillment of all prophecies, and the function of all prophecies will cease at the second coming of the Messiah. Now, itchy nose. Daniel is dealing with the Messianic kingdom. So how will this kingdom fulfill all prophecies? When Daniel spoke about the sealing up of vision and prophecy with the kingdom, 
he meant as far as Old Testament prophecy is concerned, everything will be fulfilled. Now, remember, no Old Testament prophet ever saw beyond the Messianic kingdom. That's why they didn't even know it lasted a thousand years, because no Old Testament prophet ever saw beyond the Messianic kingdom. They knew nothing of the time beyond the kingdom, such as the eternal state. The eternal state is actually New Testament revelation. To anoint the most holy place, this is the sixth and final purpose of the 77s, and this is to anoint the most holy. A better translation of the Hebrew text would be to anoint a, a most holy place. It is not a most holy person, but it is a most holy place that is to be anointed. The most holy place is the temple. Now, and this is not the first temple of Solomon, nor is it the second temple of Zerubbabel. Uh, and it's certainly not the third temple of the tribulation because God does not sanction that in any respect. It is the fourth temple. This will be the temple of the Messianic kingdom, and this temple will be built by the Lord himself, and it will be anointed as part of the program of the 77s. And that is where we're going to leave it for today. Uh, yeah, we'll leave it there. Okay. Thank you for coming along, and uh, study hard and grow strong.